So, Robert, thank you for taking the time to come and meeting with us here on the tour stop. We're in Phoenix, Arizona today, and I know you got a busy schedule at the Rich Dad. I, I could have missed this bus. Jeez. <laughs> I'm jealous. I want a bus this big. <laughs> uh, it's, been, it's been a good journey, but it's good to be here. We were really looking forward to this. You know, for me, my, my history with you goes way back. When I got out of the Army, I was told... Uh, uh, by my first uh, boss at Bally's that I need to learn sales. So I read, how, you know, uh, How to Master the Art of Selling by Tom Hopkins. My sister told me how to win friends and influence people. And then to become rich, I was told, read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And it completely changed the way I look at business. And if you've never read the book, I mean, I recommend everybody in the world to read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. This has got to be a must-read book by anybody. And whether I say it or not, 20 million people have bought it nationwide, worldwide. So this, is, this has been a big hit. But it's 33 million now. 33 million people have bought it. That's a lot more than 20. Not only that, is the book is pirated. Yes, a lot of times that's the word. It's a lot of times that's I'm signing word. autographs, and it's not my book, but who cares? Yeah. You know? R Rick, Dad, yeah. Poor Dad. So they change one letter and then they don't have no, to give you the no, just pirate, pirate in different places. Okay. Uh, more importantly, what I'm excited about is your new book, Second Chance. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about your new book, Second Chance? All right. This book came out in January of 2015. Okay. And the reason it's such a big book is this book summarizes why I wrote Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And so Second Chance is very different than Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And really, it's the history of how we got into this financial crisis. Simply said, what Second Chance says is we're being ripped off as people. And I'm not saying that's good or bad, because there's always good and bad on both sides. Mm -hmm. But this is the history of the crisis, how we got here. And the reason I wrote this book is because I put it in pictures. Because as you know, they talk about spin, and you know, politicians say everything's fine, and everybody lies. So by looking at the pictures, and there's not my graphs, they are government graphs. And it shows... In there, government yeah, graphs in gov the book. And in here is all these, you know, pictures worth a thousand words, but in here you see pictures of what's happening. Mm -hmm. this, this is really interesting. It shows the top 99% taking a hit, and the 1% get richer. And really that's what's going on, is what started to happen just a few years ago, the 1% got really rich, which is good, but unfortunately, the 99% below them took a hit. So uh, this book is just pictures and graphs and stories. And like this is a national debt in and of the United States, mm -hmm. and it's growing. This, this is not legitimate. It's, it's a lie. But anyway, you get a picture of it. So if you're a 10-year-old kid or you have a 10-year-old child, you can just take them through the pictures, and they can see what's really happening. Sure. They don't have to read sure. the book. So Very cool. it's because of what I wrote here that I wrote this book. So this one became before this one. Yeah, so this gave birth to this. Yeah, the concepts behind it. Because yeah. in 19, you know, I was, we were, I was in Vietnam in 72 and 70, 66, 72. And I knew we were being lied to as a people. And I went to military school. I was a Marine and all this. So it disturbed, disturbed me that my own government would lie to me. And so you can say, well, you're disturbed that your own government would lie to yeah, you. Yeah, we're being lied to. And I'm not saying that it's good or bad either. Do you, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Everybody's mm -hmm. got their self interest and all this. Sure. And some guys call me a non patriot, you know. Said, look, I went to Vietnam twice, a military graduate, Marine Corps officer, and I'd kill you first. <laughs> but, you know, no, what pisses me off is these guys who don't go to war call me a coward and call me a traitor. I mean, give me a break. So I have an attitude problem, if you know. But anyway, I wrote Rich Dad, Poor Dad because I could see this crisis coming. But I had to tone it down. But now that we're here, this was 1997, mm -hmm. this is 2015. Mm -hmm. A lot of the predictions I've made are now coming true. So people can now see that why I wrote this book is now coming true, if that makes sense. Let's talk about the predictions. You're, you're big on predictions, by the way. Right. And, and a big part of this book is about Buckminster Fuller. Right. Tell, tell, tell us a little bit about who's Buckminster Fuller. Yep. Buckminster Fuller is best known for the geodesic dome. And um, he was kind of a whack job, hardcore socialist. Good man, though. And they called him the friendly genius. I mean, he got a Medal of Freedom from Reagan and all this stuff. So he's, he's a very socialist smart man. Socialist who got a Medal of Freedom from Reagan. Yeah, imagine that. But, uh, and Bucky was a futurist. 
So I first went to see Bucky's Geodesic Dome in 67 in Montreal, Canada at the World's Fair. But I never met the guy. So in 81, I did meet him in Kirkwood, California, and the guy changed my life. And I went, holy mackerel. So in 1981, I was an, I was an entrepreneur. I was in rock and roll, had mm -hmm. bands like Duran Duran. I had made him boot. Duran I was Duran. Yeah, I was, I, and the police. I, had, I was having a great life, you know, sex, drugs, rock and roll. But when I met Fuller, then I realized I had a social responsibility to speak out. So in 83, I sold my business, the Nylon Wallet Company. And my wife and I and my friend Blair Singer and I hit the road teaching what we knew about entrepreneurship, but also what we saw coming in the future, and the future is now. You know, today America's largest, second largest debtor nation in the world. The gap between the 1% and 99% is massive. We have ISIS attacking us and all this stuff. The American, American empire is going down. <clears throat> so this book kind of explains how we got there from a monetary side. Can it be saved, though? Do you think it can be saved? No. You don't think it can be saved? No. Robert, there's no chance it can be saved. Zero. So how are we uh, going to be affected by uh, this prediction? Well, you have to step back and look at the bigger picture. Okay. You see, it's not just money. We're at the end of the industrial age. And the industrial age was, you know, and when an entrepreneur was in the industrial age and the entrepreneurs created jobs. For mm -hmm. example, Henry Ford, when he started Ford Motor, he created millions of jobs, mm -hmm. or thousands of jobs. Sure. This is the information age. Also, the information age gives power to people like ISIS. So today, you don't need big arms factories, you don't need tanks and all that. You can be like ISIS using your cell phone, do social media, and kick our butts. They can just take our weapons like they did they do all the time. You know, there's, there's pictures of the Iraqi army selling our weapons and tanks and guns to ISIS. So the power has shifted. You know, Mark Zuckerberg of uh, Facebook, he said, we should all read this book called The End of Power. The end of power is what's happening today. It is the end of the American empire. What's going to happen from here is what spooks everybody, and nobody really knows. So does that mean we're all going to be moving to Panama and living in a house? Uh, 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 with little to no government and they, they, they allow you to have a business or what, what's the solution? What can we do about that in America? Well, again, you have to, what, what Fuller taught me, Bucky Fuller taught me, he passed away in 1983 and okay. that's when I stepped in to do what I had to do. He says you always have to look at the big picture. Too many people look at, well, what's, what's going to happen to me? Well, you look at the big picture, you're also going to know <clears throat> that when something bad happens, something good's going to happen. Mm -hmm. But you've got to prepare for whatever is coming. If you think the last next 20 years will be like the last 20 years, mm -hmm. you're going to get creamed. You know, when you and I go to the supermarket and we buy a carton of milk, we always check for the expiration date. But most people do not check for the expiration date on their brains. So, the, so what this book says here, the most obsolete idea, is go to school, get a job, work hard, save money, get out of debt, and invest for the long term in the stock market. See, why would you save money when they're printing trillions of dollars? Why would you invest in the stock market for the long term when you have HFT, high frequency trading, and the Dow is at 18,000? So what do you do? Well, that's what I'm saying. You've got to look at the other side. Which, which way is it going to go? So do you keep cash? Because if you keep cash, you're Why losing money. Why would you money. save cash? Why would you save cash? They're if printing you, cash. Sure, if you invest into real estate. So w what's the solution it's to every, it? When I write up on a second chance, everything is opposite. Instead of get out of debt, I get into debt. You know, I just refinanced $300 million in debt. I went from 5% to 2.5% interest. I made a fortune. Every month, more money comes in because my cost of money has gone down. So while some Especially financial today. experts are saying, get out of debt, I'm saying, learn how to use debt. Mm. See, so when I came back from seven, in Vietnam in January 73, mm -hmm. the first thing my rich dad said to me was go to school to learn how to invest in real estate. It wasn't real estate, it was how to use debt and taxes. Debt and taxes make the rich richer. Debt and taxes make the poor and middle class poor. So all the rich guys who are doctors and lawyers or, you know, those guys, they're hmm. getting creamed. And they don't know why. Doctors are getting creamed. Oh, yeah, they're making more money, but the take home is less. Sure. You know, I, I, my doctor just yelled at me. He was happy. He says, oh, guess what? I finally made a million dollars. And I said, yeah, this is just three weeks ago. <laughs> and so I said, yeah, well, well, how much you pay in tax? This is 2014. He says seven hundred fifty thousand in taxes. Mm. So his net was about four hundred thousand. That's not bad, but when I make a million bucks, I keep a million bucks. 
And the reason is because I don't make it by working for money. See, if you work for money, you're taxed. So that's why lesson number one in Rich Dad Poor Dad is the rich don't work for money. What we do instead is we create businesses as entrepreneurs. We acquire real estate. I don't invest in the stock market. Okay. So the reason is because as entrepreneurs, I have more control over my income, how much I make, and how much I pay in taxes. And because I'm an entrepreneur as well as an investor mm -hmm. in real estate, I pay zero tax. So every time I make, let's say, a million dollars as an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. I immediately invest it in real estate. I have a four to one step up. So I put a million dollars in real estate. I get four, four hundred. I get four million from the bank. That's why I love banks. But the banks are screwing everybody else. You know, terrible. But it's good for me. That's so, why you say when you print, it's good for you. But when you print, it's bad for people that work for money. Because when you print, savers get creamed, and people who work for money get creamed. When they print, debtors get rich. You see, debt and taxes make the rich richer. And debt and taxes make the poor middle class poorer. And that's what I cover in this little book here. See, when you look at history, any time a country printed, they corrupted the money supply, the, the empire collapsed. See, the Romans tried it. Mm -hmm. And it was called debasing the currency. Debasing means they took a silver coin and they mixed base metals like nickel and copper and those things inside. America started doing the same debasing in 1964. So when you look at our silver coins, you know, in 1963, they were pure, not pure silver, they were silver. And in 1964, you go, oh, what's that little copper tinge there? That's debasing. So throughout history, any time a government has debased or printed their money, the economy eventually collapses. So the Romans tried it, you know, Zimbabwe did it, the Germans did it, Milosevic did it. China did it. So every time they print money, history will tell you the same thing. If we know it, why are we printing money? Because people don't understand history. Who are the people that don't understand? Our politicians don't understand history they or the voters? You. They don't teach you this in school here. So people can look at the charts, you know, so you can have, they can look at the charts, but they don't, they don't know what they're looking at. You know, I was, in, I was going for my MBA, and I had, I had to drop out because it was getting pretty ridiculous because I kept telling the, the professor of economics, I said, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> you know, and you don't get good grades, you don't get good grades, you're out, right? So I, I decided, well, I'll, I'll avoid the rush and resign now. <laughs> but what they teach you in school is BS. It's watered down. It's not appropriate for the real world. It's good if you're going to be an academic like my poor dad, and you have all the facts and figures, but they can't do anything. You know, like the... Unemployment figures are complete lies. You know, Obama says they're at six. I'm not political. I'm not Republican, Democrat. Obama says they're six percent. This guy John Williams, who's called a shadow stats guy, he says the real unemployment is twenty-four percent. So it's I a asked, big difference. Yeah. So I asked him, so what happened? How did you come across this? And John Williams was an economist. He was working for Boeing or Lockheed, and he kept applying the government unemployment and government stats to Boeing's numbers, and mm -hmm. nothing worked. Mm. So finally he realized, which I realized in Vietnam, we're being lied to. Our numbers are bogus. They're not true. So that's why <clears throat> I started writing this book. And now what, you know, I said your house is not an asset. Savers are losers. The rich don't work for money. In that was 1997. 2015, they're coming true. So second chance is how I came to my assumptions and conclusions. Now, now let me ask you. So I have like three questions for you, but I'll do one of them. Uh, so, with the collapse that you're saying, Robert, can anything be done about the collapse to prevent it? Yeah, this is the good news, okay? When something goes down, something goes up. Sure. So, uh, I have a video coming out which I'll un un unshamelessly promote. It's called The Man Who Could Feel the See the Future. The Man Who Could See the Future. Yeah, and it's about Bucky Fuller, but it's about Dr. Buckminster Fuller, but it's about this book here. Can you tell the website so everybody knows what, what link they could find it on? Yeah, the man who can see the future, who could see the future is from richdad.com. Richdad.com. And it's English right now. It also has Spanish subtitles. The reason I did the man who could see the future is because more people will watch a video than, you know, than read a read book. Read a book. And hopefully they'll read this book to study if they want more detail on it. Mm. So the video is a better way of communication. 
and it's for free, and I ask people to watch the video and stop it and discuss it with their friends, you know, what, what is called cheating in school discussion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can do it with your friends and under, kind of understand the concepts because everything in Second Chance is opposite of what they teach you in school. You see that? So why do, they, why do we keep going to school, though, Robert? If that's a, so, so, so now let's, let's do the alternative. Here's a, a devil's advocate question for you. So let's say if everything they teach you in school doesn't work, what if we get rid of school? Then what would happen? Would it be better if we had no educational system at all? No, I'm saying education is more important before. It's just obsolete. You know, there's Moore's Law that Moore's Law, which states information doubles every 18 months. In other words, everything's obsolete 18 months. Mm. So, and this is just a recent phenomenon. So when you come out of school, you're already obsolete. And that's why I'm the old guy, you know. I meet my friends who went to Harvard. See, I went to Harvard. I said, yeah, that was how long, 50 years ago? You know, what we talked about earlier, when you go to the supermarket, you buy a carton of milk, the first thing you check for is the expiration date. <laughs> you know, if the expiration date, let's say it's March 1st and, you know, and it's already July, you better not drink that milk. Sure. The same thing happens inside our brains, is when we have obsolete ideas, we get obsolete results. So what's happening for most people, the idea of going to school, mm -hmm. getting a job, working hard, saving money, getting out of debt, buying your house because it's an asset, investing for the long term, is obsolete. The world has changed. The world changed in 1971 when President Nixon took us off the gold standard and money became debt. So that's what, that's what I wrote about in this book, what Fuller and my rich dad were saying, is that our wealth is being stolen via the money we work for. So when you save money, why would you save money? Because back in 1970, just before Nixon took us off the gold standard, I could go to a bank, I got 15 to 18 percent interest plus a toaster. You know what I mean? Today, the banks are charging you interest to save money. In other words, the banks don't want your money because they printed too much of it. And that's why there's these bubbles and stocks and bubbles and real estate and all this. People are dumping the cash. Because as I said in here, savers are losers and cash is trash. And yet people well, I want a high paying job. Well, that's an obsolete idea. Get out of debt is an obsolete idea. You should learn how to get into debt, how to use debt to get rich. And they'll never teach you about taxes. The reason the 1% is way up here and the 99% are going this way is because when you print money, two things happen, inflation and taxes. It's crushing. And so this book here was written because this book was written 20, approximately 20 years earlier. But now I can say what I really knew in Second Chance. So this gave birth to this? That's which came first. You know? That's they're one both, of those chicken or the egg. Okay. I can say things now <clears throat> I couldn't say here because they've now come true. Got it. Yeah. Got it. So I, I, have a, I have a question for you. So voting. If you're saying <laughs> the government tells us, let's talk about voting for a second. If you're saying government tells us unemployment is 6%, but the reality is 24%, and you're also saying we need to be educated. Would you say the American people who vote, do we really know all the information that we're voting with or no? Of course not. But also ask yourself this question. You know, when I was a kid, mm -hmm. there was one vote one for one, one person, one vote. Mm -hmm. Today it's $1 million, one vote. You know, with the sub, sub packs and all this sure, stuff. Sure, sure. You know, the Cook brother, Koch brothers and all this stuff. If you're... If you're not spending like $200 million, you can't get elected. So what happens now, these, what do you, what do you call them? Super PACs? Super PACs mm -hmm. and all this stuff, sure. they buy the vote. Mm -hmm. If you think your vote counts, wake up. Really, wake up. The people controlling the economy today, I'm not saying this wrong, are the major corporations and the unions. So the unions, you know, they, they want to get their people elected, and the unions control the school system. And the, and the big corporations are kind of more of the capitalist side, and all they care about is their corporations. You know, when people, I, I always laugh at people, say, oh, I'm so proud of Apple. It's an American company. It's a BS. Apple's not an American company. Apple's an international company. You know, its headquarters are in Cupertino, California, mm -hmm. but its factories are in China, Korea, the Philippines, and they keep their money offshore. That's really the real world of entrepreneurship today. And any entrepreneur who thinks, I'm just going to make money, I'm going to start a business and make a lot of money, because what we talk about, they really have got to smell the roses, man. You know, that's not what the real entrepreneurs are doing. 
Okay, so that's that's why I wrote Rich Dad Poor Dad. I'm glad people are becoming entrepreneurs, but most of them are still trying to make money. Why would you just make money when you're being ripped off via the money system? And I'm not saying it's good or bad. I like it. You know, I love the big banks. You know why? Because they give me the people who save money, money. So when you save money, the banks give it to me. Thank God. When you buy insurance, they get it. They give it to me. And that's the game. And you know who gets the tax breaks? Me. You look at my buddy, not my buddy, my, I'd like to be his buddy, it's Elon Musk. He doesn't pay tax. He gets, what, $50 billion? Elon Musk doesn't pay taxes. No, but he gets tax breaks. Sure. So I get tax the breaks. incentives. Yeah. Right. And subsidies. Mm -hmm. So the, the LA Times just went, oh, Elon Musk is ripping us off and all that. Well, he's doing, Elon Musk is doing what all entrepreneurs should be doing, which is providing jobs and bringing in investment. That's what they do. So when, you know, when Elon stayed out of New York, I don't know how many millions they put into a factory to build his batteries, well, they gave it to him for one dollar a year. Why? Because when Elon moves his business into this factory and I think is where Kodak is, anywhere that, Rochester, I think that's where it is, he'll move jobs in there. Nevada just gave him 1.3 billion in tax subsidies and supplements because he's going to move jobs in there, and that's what real entrepreneurs do. So, do we need more entrepreneurs? Absolutely. That, okay. But the trouble is, most entrepreneurs, there's 28 million small business owners mm -hmm. in America. Mm -hmm. 24 million are are, are, what, are one person entrepreneurs. They're called non-employee entrepreneurs. So, the, because and that's what happens is when people don't really understand what an entrepreneur does. So most big people are self-employed, but they're not really entrepreneurs. The self-employed pay the highest taxes of all, and nobody tells them that. So, so that's why I was laughing about my doctor. I made a million something. I said, yeah, how much you pay in tax? 750. Is that smart? And so when I talk to him, he gets all confused because he did the right things. He went to school, he works hard, it's he and his wife and the business, you know, and they're really good people, but they're not financially educated. So when I talk to him about how I can make six or seven million a year and not pay taxes, his head hurts because he, he didn't have this book, you know what I mean? So, so let's talk about this. Uh, Robert, simple question. Can anybody become rich? I believe so. So I, this is what I believe. Sure. In every one of us is a poor person. There's still a poor person inside me. And I still go to the supermarket and say, oh, Crest is on sale or Colgate's on sale. <laughs> There's also a middle class person. And the middle class person wants security. They want that steady paycheck. And that is a rich person. And they're all inside of us except that it's not taught. It, you're taught to go to school, get a job, and get a paycheck. You're not taught to how to get rich. If you read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, my rich dad refused to pay me. He said the paycheck was one of the most damaging things you could take in your life. He says the moment you take a paycheck, you're an employee, and that's the mindset. So my rich dad never paid me. He drew up my poor dad, you know, government employee, and that's, you gotta pay people, you gotta pay people. And rich dad was not saying that the paycheck was bad. He says you, you didn't want to be a slave to money. So as an entrepreneur, you know, if, if, if Rich Dad folded, i just start another company. I don't need a paycheck. I don't need anybody to take care of me. If my government doesn't like me, I move to another country because they need entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. So the entrepreneur is not so much the business. The entrepreneur is really the mindset and the skill sets and the different set of rules. You see, I don't operate, small business does not operate in the same rules as big business. Do you think the direction America is going right now, they're driving some of the entrepreneurs out? You can't drive a real entrepreneur out. When I say out, meaning out of the country, could that be they move where somebody way. says, I'm going to go outsource or I'm going to go move my business elsewhere? You think, you think that's a cause and effect? Could be, but I, don't, I think they're just lousy entrepreneur. <laughs> Got it. Look, it, you know, people say, well, you know, if they make the regulations real hard, the guy can't be an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs have one thing in common. They keep going. They'll change the rules. They'll reinvent the rules. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't just take one answer. So a real entrepreneur, it really makes no difference which country you're in. 
that's my beliefs. I not I. I love that. You know, what I mean, it's yeah. it's just a mindset. You know, it's f you. You mess with me, I'll find a way around it. You know, I have a friend. <laughs> is multi 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 family rich guy from France, and the, you know, France is as communistic as it gets. Seventy five percent top line for million dollar earners. Yeah, but that's why he lives here. <laughs> so he he started buying vineyards in Napa and Sonoma. So he went back to the French government and says, it's his wine. He says, I want to ship my wine in bulk to California. And the government says, you can't do that. So this what, is the French government saying you can't ship. Yeah, and here's a guy, he's, I think he's five generations, you know, French wine guy. This guy, is, this guy is an entrepreneur, entrepreneur. He says, okay, I can't ship him in barrels. The guy goes, yeah. He says, okay, I'll ship him in bottles. <laughs> So he bottled all of his stuff. It cost him more money, but he still figured out how to do it. Do, do you know what I mean? And hard, now yeah. he has his wine with his California wine and yeah. all this. And so he went back to the French government and said, here, try this. See if it's not better. And so now they're all confused because he didn't break any rules. So I'll say it again. Entrepreneur is a mindset first, a skill set, and rules. And depending upon whether you're an employee or a small business, mm -hmm. the roles are different. The mindsets are different. The skill sets are different. So what you're saying is education, the mindsets can be taught. And if I learn the mindsets, and uh, 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 earlier you talked about when I asked you a question about can somebody go out there and do something about this, there's, there's got to be desire. But if I feed my mind, I got desire, I have an opportunity to make it as an entrepreneur. Desire and ambition. Sure. That's what it takes. Sure. That's why I say everybody can, everybody can open a lemonade stand, but very few can be a rich one. So last question, and we'll wrap up here about, about this book, is, is earlier um, when you were talking about America's going to collapse. Great. I asked you a question. I said, what do you think is one of the biggest challenges that we're looking at? And you mentioned willpower. Can, can you elaborate on that willpower a little bit, on what you meant by that? Yeah, it, it's also called the entrepreneurial spirit. Mm -hmm. But what we were actually talking about was there's no such thing as a bad economy. You know, there's the external, you and I, we all have an external economy, but we also have an internal economy. Mm -hmm. And the willpower is to change our internal economy. So for me, I can see the good and I can see the bad. I don't really give a damn because I'm going to be rich anyway. But a poor person with a poor personal economy, all they're going to see is a bad economy because they don't know how to make money in any economy. And a middle class person, they have a middle class economy, you know, they, but they want is a nice house and a steady paycheck and the job and the car. And so when you take their job away to them, that's disaster. Well, since an entrepreneur doesn't have a job anyway, it's no big deal. So all I'm saying to people, and it's what Bucky Fuller taught me, is always two sides, you know what I mean? You know, to use plural at minimum two. So if you think the economy is bad, it's because your economy is bad. If you think that steady you know, employment is important, then you'll see an, an, an economy without jobs. Your economy. Your, your economy DMA versus economy. the external economy. Got it. What you control versus what you can't control. I can control. Yeah, it's called, sure. a, it's called an internal focus mm -hmm. versus an external focus. Mm -hmm. So the real entrepreneur has an internal focus. But if they fall down, they say, oh, this is good because I'm going to go up higher. You know, the average person will fall down and say, oh, I'm going to take some Prozac. Or, or, the, or somebody has some mistakes, all oh, the mistakes don't matter. Well, mistakes, mistakes matter. It means you didn't know something. But a real entrepreneur, whether they fall down, they go, they always can go up. They can stand back up and go higher. That no matter what happens to them, they get stronger and better and smarter and happier. But a person with a weak internal mindset is that they're so afraid of what happens, it generally happens. Like, you know, people who are afraid of losing their jobs, they generally lose their mm -hmm. jobs. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, so no doubt. So everything you, you comes through you. Yeah, so the entrepreneur, first job is to control inside here, not outside there. So I'm right now, six of us, everybody that's here right now, we're living in an RV for the next 30 days. We're going to 35 states, 10,000 miles, and we're encouraging people to consider becoming entrepreneurs. What could you say? If you could say one thing to somebody who has never been an entrepreneur, and they're thinking about making the leap of faith into becoming an entrepreneur. What could you tell them? 
Well, I'll just tell them the same thing that happened to me. You know, my last paycheck, I still remember it clearly. It was one of the worst and the best days of my life. And I was in Puerto Rico. I was, in, I was working for Xerox. And my boss gave me my last, it wasn't a paycheck, it was a bonus check. I think it was about 30,000 bucks. Taxable is the only problem with that. So I got this check and I went, holy mackerel. You know what I mean? So I was excited, but I was also disturbed. And so this other guy comes up to me, his name was John. And John says to me, he says, you're going to be back. I said, why? He says, because you're going to fail. I looked at him and said, look, a few expletive words. Because that's what he did. He left Xerox, failed, and he came back. And I said, look, da-da-da, you failed and you come, came back. But I'm going to fail and I'm never coming back. And that's the attitude. Do you know what I mean? If, yeah, if, absolutely. If you say, well, if I fail, I'll go back to mommy and daddy, then that's what you'll do. So if you fail, that's when I became an entrepreneur because I had no money. I had no money for years. You know, I didn't have a paycheck. But that's what my rich dad encouraged me to do. He says, when, you're, when you don't have this paycheck, you get hungrier, smarter, and it's a test of your character. Will you become a crook? Will you become dishonest? Will you cheat and steal? Or will you become a better human being? So really, that's the benefit of becoming an entrepreneur. You really find out who you are when you don't have anything. If you're an entrepreneur and you're going to be a big entrepreneur, leadership skills and communication skills are more important than a law degree. So now I have another book that just came out. It's called The Eight Lessons in Military Leadership. In the military, I went to military academy and all that. I, you know, from day one, you're learning leadership. You know, day one at the academy, I have to stand in front of 20, 18-year-old kids and go, section, 10, hut. And naturally, they're going to they're say, screw you, you know. So that's when you learn to be a leader. Now, as you said to me when we first met, the trouble with the military got a little rough. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a hard time when I came back from yeah. Vietnam and I went to work for Xerox and, you know, people don't like the idea to call them an asshole and a fuckhead, you know, stuff like that. Every other word is a curse word in the military. Yeah, it's hey, just hey, an adjective. Hey, fuckhead, you know, do this. <laughs> you know, but they don't, oh, I'm going to call my HR person. <laughs> I better, I better make some changes here. You know what I'm talking about? Of course I know. You what can't you're talk straight no. in corporate America. In know? the military, you can. It's it's. You uh, have to. Yeah, you, you have they, no they choice. They love it. Yeah. You, know, you when, actually get promotions if you do in the military. Well, when I got called names, I said, "Oh, the guy likes me." <laughs> so that's why, for all you guys who are military <laughs> veterans, you know, you have probably the number one skill to be an entrepreneur, which is leadership, the ability to listen, to not take it personally and he'll still get the job done. It is the best training in the world. You know, the saddest thing about leaving the military was leaving the guys behind there. They were some of the best in the world. And, that, and they, were, you know, they weren't all college graduates. They were just my gunners, my mechanics, you know, all this stuff. The camaraderie's priceless. Oh, geez, it's priceless. The camaraderie's priceless. And so all I did when I, when I started the Rich Dad Company was to have that same sense of teamwork inside Rich Dad. That's why there's no ranks and all this stuff in this company. Everybody gets to say what they want to say. People are free to do what they want. I stay out of their way, and we get the job done. That's amazing. And I look at this, you know, international influence, the cash flow quadrant game, which uh, 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 I remember vividly buying it the first time back in 1999 or 2000. My sister and her husband, they have a family night. I don't know what the night is. I think it's Friday night they have a family night, and they sit there, six-year-old niece, uh, seven-year-old niece and six-year-old nephew, they play the game yeah. regularly at that age. Well, learning how to do thing. that. What's going to happen to that six-year-old in 10 years? Complete different mindset. Complete different mindset. It's a shift in mindset, yeah. the way they're going to think. And that's why my rich dad never gave me a paycheck. He says, the moment you take that paycheck, you're an employee. You've got to be stronger than that. It's about inside control. So, so just so you know, I can sit here for four, five, six hours with you and talk, and I will enjoy every second of it. <laughs> but uh, we, we gonna, we gonna, we gonna thank you for your time you well, gave us. You. To, you've been very kind, and uh, uh, to have the opportunity to sit here with you and have this conversation about entrepreneurism, your books, uh, it's been very exciting. From a guy who read your book back in 1999, 2000, getting out of the army, and now to meet you, it's an honor, it's a privilege. And if I can tell you anything that you're watching, if you haven't read this, you gotta read this book. 
And obviously this, you heard him say it, it's what he couldn't say back then with this, he's now saying this, about the second chance. I highly recommend buying both books. The link is gonna be put on the bottom for both books, as well as the link to watch the video, which you said is on richdad.com. Yeah, it's 60 minutes long. You'll get as much financial education that you'll never get in school. And it's on the website. They just go in there, they'll see the website. I want you to download it for free. Okay. You know, but when, every time you watch it, anytime you don't understand something, stop and discuss. But when I discuss things in school, at test time, it's called cheating. <laughs> In entrepreneurism, it's a different story. Yes, right? very different. Sounds good. Excellent. Well, it's it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's been it's been great. It's been great hanging out uh, with you. It's been a lot of fun. Hopefully, one of these days, when uh, 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 the book, another book, you come out with, we get a chance to come back and interview again and sit down and have another conversation. I appreciate it. This this has been a privilege. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Robert. Thank you. Definitely. Thanks, Definitely. Thank you.